I should state that the talk is really just, um, it's more focused on an overview of ongoing work at the moment. And essentially, uh, I'm focusing here on presenting a framework uh, for the framework that we developed to um, assess, determine critical loads. And um, <clears throat> even though it shows some results, we actually haven't assessed any results, so they're just there as an example. And overall, it's, it should be very much um, a high level overview. In terms of the layout of the talk, I'll present a little bit on background, but essentially I'll introduce and mention what is a critical load. I assume that not everyone in the room was familiar with a critical load, so I have some slides which I'm familiar with. I like to show them again and again. It gives me some comfort. Uh, I'll present the objectives, and they're straightforward enough in that um, we're determining critical loads, but there are challenges to that, and the challenges of what I'll mention and discuss essentially data availability and how to uh, essentially improve the resolution of the data across the study domain. We're using, I think, our, uh, a generic methodology, essentially a framework. Uh, it's, being, it's not proposed by us. Essentially, we're uh, adopting other methods that have been out, used out there. Our focus here that it should be transparent, reproducible, uh, and again, uh, with the assumption that it's worked elsewhere, it should work here. And I'll present that framework. And lastly, I'll try and present uh, an example of some application. So an, uh, an application of this framework to surface waters, essentially lakes. That's what I'll mostly focus on. I'll give a little brief overview of our ongoing work on soils. And in terms of lakes, essentially I'll just repeat or expand on some work which was recently published by Hazel Cathcart, uh, looking at lakes in northern Alberta. But this work I'll present expand northern Saskatchewan. This expands out to cover northern Alberta as well. Uh, critical load has been defined as a quantitative estimate of exposure to one or more pollutants below which significant harmful effects on sensitive elements of the environment do not occur according to present knowledge. Uh, essentially, it was proposed during a workshop in 1988 as co cluster. It's an effects based approach to emission reductions and essentially tries to link the impact of emissions onto ecosystems and ensure protection in that ecosystem receptor. And uh, it came from or is based on a target load concept developed. Uh, by Canadian scientists. So essentially aims to set levels of deposition at a level so we won't see negative ecosystem effects. Basic idea of the critical load concept is to balance the deposition that an ecosystem is exposed to with the capacity of the ecosystem to buffer the input, uh, essentially to ensure that there's no harmful effects. So an example here, we can see that acid deposition is a off balance, essentially perhaps causing some negative impacts to the system. So in this case here, we would have some reduction in deposition to bring it back into balance, essentially ensuring that ecosystem buffering capacity or deposition is matching ecosystem buffering capacity. And of course, through an inverse modeling approach that would be done by reducing emissions or ensuring that emissions never reached a level that exceeded deposition. I've just mentioned the word exceedance. Essentially, the risk of ecosystem impacts uh, when you've as, as determined your critical load, you compare that to atmospheric deposition. In the case where atmospheric deposition is greater than the critical load, we expect to see some, or there is a greater risk of negative impacts. That's termed an exceedance of critical load, and essentially the magnitude, the greater the magnitude of exceedance and the greater the area extent of exceedance, the greater the risk of ecosystem damage. The approach is widely used. Uh, it's been used to assess the impacts of anthropogenic sulfur, nitrogen deposition, and air concentrations, which I won't discuss, on terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Essentially, it's been used to underpin uh, policy and emission reductions. It's been used, or it's mentioned in the Canada-wide acid rain strategy for post-2000. It's used uh, within the Canada-US Air Quality Agreement. Um, it's been developed and used within the New England Governor's Eastern Canadian, Canadian Premier's work. It underpins, or it's used within the Alberta uh, Asset Deposition Management Framework. And of course, uh, it underpins the 1999 Gothenburg Protocol underneath the uh, UNEC Convention on Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution. And again, I'll just mention the linking of ecosystem response to deposition level is the central, central principle uh, of the critical loads approach. So essentially, uh, some level of quality or level of protection is assigned to an ecosystem and the level of deposition that that ecosystem receives is set to ensure that there isn't a, essentially damage occurring. 
and that again is through, uh, could be through emission reductions or at least ensure emissions don't lead to uh, high levels of deposition which exceed critical load. Given that the approach has been widely used and for quite some time now, uh, there are well-established methods. So to some extent, uh, this assumption is made that the uh, methods are well-established, have been widely used, and therefore applicable in this region. Uh, the mass balance approaches for surface waters and forests are the ones we're using. They're discussed in detail in a manual on mapping methodologies uh, for critical loads, published in 2004 and updated, or currently being updated. And also last year, uh, those methods are discussed, revised uh, in a new book on critical load and dynamic risk assessment. So essentially, uh, we're using well-tested, well-used methods. And in application here, there's of course some discussion with respect to the parameters and use, the level of protection, etc. But at the moment, we've mostly for, focused on really just applying the method here. In terms of applying the concept, well, critical loads, as I've, I've been talking about maps and aerial exceedance, essentially they're best uh, represented as maps and essentially map data efficiently handled in the GIS system. So it's very much a spatial uh, geographical, uh, geographical approach to assessing impacts. In general, you accumulate or acquire data layers, map layers, which represent deposition, ecosystem buffering capacity, etc., and combine them in a mass balance approach to set your critical limit or critical load. So uh, the objective of the work we've, uh, we're carrying out or are carrying out is to determine uh, uh, termination of critical loads uh, for the oil sands region. And it's a fairly trivial, very straightforward. The focus uh, or where we fit under in the oil sands monitoring program is with respect to impacts on ecosystem health but I'll just jump forward for a second to this slide here, and uh, it's been carried out before. We can see here two examples of maps uh, that are critical load or at least receptor sensitivity. I think the first one on the left is taken from the Alberta Asset Deposition Management Framework, and uh, the one on the right comes from the um, Asset Rain Task Group under the Canadian Council of the Ministers for the Environment. They show various uh, interpretations or applications of the critical load concept, but you can see a resolution difference. So our main challenge was really to determine critical loads at a data resolution that is appropriate to assess regional impacts. And we've seen from Paul's work that the modeling deposition is a 2.5 and now, which is just seen today, at a one kilometer resolution. So essentially we're trying to develop critical loads at that scale, given the availability of observation-based data, so that it's consistent with the deposition modeling and also uh, to try and incorporate more sophisticated spatial prediction techniques. And by more sophisticated, what I mean is essentially compared to current methods that have been used or previous methods. In a sense, these maps are essentially other spatial prediction routines. Uh, they perhaps have the same underlying map, which may be a soil map, which is a coarse resolution. They overlay a grid, and there's an assumption that the soil properties that may be at a few uh, observed only at a few points are representative of that grid and essentially I would assume that there's not too much difference between the underlying layers of those maps other than the grid that's draped over them. Uh, for the study, uh, this figure here shows the study domain that we're working with. It's a little bit difficult to see here. Uh, there's a smaller grey box, it's about 600 kilometres by 700 kilometres, that's centred over northern Alberta, northern Saskatchewan, and uh, just moving into the northwestern territories. That's essentially the main study domain that we've been focusing on. Uh, it was initially selected to cover the majority of the lake surveys that were being carried out in Saskatchewan and Alberta. It also uh, tried to encompass the new monitoring stations that were being set up by uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada. And also you can see some trajectory analysis there showing 24-hour uh, trajectories over 2005 and essentially to encompass those major directories, uh, trajectories coming from uh, oil sands emissions. One of the things you'll note here as well is also the orange crosses essentially are showing lake locations. And we can see a significant number of lake locations, but we can also see areas where we don't have lakes. And so Ultimately, what we're trying to do is predict lake chemistry for those areas where we don't have lakes. Spatial prediction, in this case, is the process of estimating the values of a target quantity, essentially lake concentration, at an unvisited location. Uh, we, over, the, over the past 30 or so years, there's been a lot of work in this area. Um, 
basically, if you look back at uh, Tobler's first law of geography, everything is related to everything else, but nearer things are more related. That's led into the development of spatial interpola interpolation. And of course, uh, with an understanding of spatial autocorrelation, that's progressed into uh, Krieging since about the 1970s. And Krieging is a popular technique with respect to predicting at unvisited locations. In addition, of course, we know that auxiliary continuous information is available in the form of maps of covariates, which can explain much of the variation in target variables. So for example, it's not surprising that you might visit a lake and it, have, it would have low base cation concentrations in a region of base poor geology, thin soils, etc. So we see those correlations. And if we have some continuous maps of these covariates, we can use those. And this is widely done in techniques such as uh, land use regression. Land use regression is widely used by uh, in air pollution studies looking at exposure to populations, they look at the land use around it and build more detailed uh, pictures or maps of exposure of the population to air pollutants. It's also done from a catchment-based regression point of view where catchments are assumed to be the main contributing area for a lake and that can be used as a landscape unit to predict concentrations or changes to the lake. So in this case we've taken those two and we've more or less adopted a framework developed by Tomislav Hengel and others. Uh, the, he proposed a generic framework for spatial prediction of soil variables based on a regression Krieging approach. And essentially, regression Krieging is a spatial prediction technique that combines a regression of a dependent variable on, uh, dependent variable on auxiliary, var auxiliary variables, so, such as uh, you're predicting temperature, but using altitude as one of the predictors. And it combines that with Krieging of the regression residuals. And that's a key thing, essentially. You capture as much of the trend that you can with an auxiliary variable, a covariate, and then capture the rest using a, a Krieging approach. And the picture here taken from Hengel shows some examples of the diff different methods. The picture under A essentially shows observations of soil depth. The larger the circle, or the larger, the deeper the soil. A simple mapped based spatial prediction approach would just essentially take a soil map in, in B, overlay that and just average them per polygon, which is the approach which has been widely used to date, say for example in some of the critical load work that I've done. Uh, and example C, that's just taking those points in A and just interpolating using ordinary, ordinary interpolation and or Krieging interpolating them out. And we can see it has a smoother surface. In D, that's a regression based approach looking at some covariate in, uh, for the points in map A and predicting across space. And E then combines the regression layer in D and then, then the, uh, the uh, Krieging of the residuals. And you can see it has a much more finer texture, but also is more representative of the observations in uh, A. So I'll try and get through an example before my time is up. Uh, an example of a regression Krieging framework, essentially, we've been using to determine uh, critical loads of the cities for surface waters. First step in that is really the selection of the target variable. So we went back to the critical loads uh, mass balance equation for surface waters. And there are three variables which are key, base cation concentrations in lakes, sulfate concentrations in lakes, and DOC concentrations in lakes. So our goal is to come up with a prediction scheme to predict those concentrations in lakes across the study domain. Uh, and in terms of the lakes themselves, we collated about 1,300 lake observations. They were drawn from uh, Environment Canada's Level 1 and Level 2 lake surveys, uh, the surveys carried out by Saskatchewan Environment. Also, of course, the ramp uh, network. And uh, to try and fill some spatial gaps in the western and southwestern areas, we went back to some of the historic data, data sets in the Alberta Environment and Parks Surface Water Quality Database. And some of those are a little bit old. Most of them are into the 2000s, but we've uh, gone back just to fill some of those gaps so we can have a better spatial prediction routine. Uh, second step was, of course, to define that spatial resolution of prediction rather than these big map blocks. Uh, we looked at all the lakes in the area. There are more than 1, 000, uh, 160,000 lake catchments, and we delineated out catchments around each of those lakes using the Thiessen polygon approach. So essentially, each, catch, each lake had a unique catchment around it, and we made the assumption that that contributing area would be a better predictor of the lake concentrations. 
Third step, which is really time consuming, is the preparation of the covariate data. So essentially we amass more than 100 different uh, variables. These are put together in what's known as a raster stack, so it takes a fair bit of geoprocessing in terms of um, collating, slicing, upscaling, downscaling the different data sets. Some of the data sets uh, have been recently developed. The National Forest Inventory have uh, produced a nice data set with over 100 different variables. We drew 28 from that. Climate data produced by, the, again, the Forest Service uh, from Agnesbline, over 30 layers we've taken from that. From the uh, ISRIC, which is the World uh, Soils Data Center, they've recently produced a World Soils Map. We used 30 or so co um, covariates from them. And I should also note that many of the layers, uh, we can, the, the approach accommodates categorical maps. So for example, a geology map, which may have six or seven geology classes, that's divided out into seven indicator maps, which become binary maps in terms of whether there's presence or absence of the different uh, geology coverage. And then we developed uh, the regression creaking model. Uh, this is a very simple slide, but it's the one where it really takes a lot of work. There's several steps. Uh, the framework proposed by Hengel um, suggests that the target variables, essentially, in this case here, base cation concentration in lakes, is first transformed to ensure normality, but also normality of the residuals. The proposal logit transformation to ensure back transformation happens smoothly. Uh, again, we have over 100 um, covariates. Those, it's not surprising, show a lot of multi multicollinearity. So to remove that, we've carried out uh, factorial analysis, which is essentially principal component analysis, kept the best predictors, and then use those in a stepwise regression, but also tested random forest neural networks, etc. And you can see here in the right-hand side, we've also um, looked at the residuals from that trend approach, and then fit a semi ferrogram to interpolate out a spatial layer. I'll be quick with one or two more slides. This is spatial prediction for base cations. We can see spatial variation. And now the thing to note here is this is base cation concentration predicted in lakes, but it's visualized with respect to the catchment. Uh, the approach also allows us to estimate upper and lower boundaries, so that's the 90th percentile there. And uh, the spatial pattern is not inconsistent with the uh, geology pattern, showing uh, lower concentrations in the Athabatha Basin and the Precambrian Shield. Last step is to take those different predicted layers, combine them in terms of critical loads to estimate a critical load map. And this here again, it's critical loads, dark colors, lower critical load. And taking the data that Paul showed earlier on, we can overlay to produce or determine exceedance. And this again is some of the older data. I know it's changed now that Paul has provided us. I'll skip to the next bit, which is essentially a brief note on soils. We're working in the same with soils, but there's more challenges. Now, final comments is that uh, we're currently in the phase of, I guess, evaluating reporting on the critical loads for lakes. We're working on the spatial predictions of soil weathering rates, so that's ongoing, but essentially it's uh, a task that has been amalgamating and uh, subsampling from existing surveys of soils and carrying out new analysis, but also to bring together historic data sets that we can use as covariates. And there's been a lot of contributors in terms of data, samples, funding, time, and even the methodology, and uh, they're greatly acknowledged. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn Campbell with Alberta Wilderness Association. What do the exceedances tell us? Um, I mentioned that we, ha we, we haven't uh, yet assessed those exceedances. In terms of surface waters, uh, a limit is set for surface waters to ensure protection of, say, biodiversity or ecosystem health with respect to fish life. So an exceedance would indicate a risk of damage to fish or some other aquatic organism. Essentially, it's set as a level of ANC, acid neutralizing capacity in the lake. And in general, I didn't go into the details of the equation, it's somewhere between 10 and 20, a concentration of 10 to 20 micro equivalents per liter set to protect in the lake, if we were see, yeah, essentially as a level of protection for aquatic biota. And if you have deposition and exceedance of critical load, it means you can't store or maintain that level of uh, acid neutralizing capacity, and it may lead to ecosystem damage in terms of fish loss or loss of aquatic life. <laughs>